Good morning, everyone. Today we're on day five of 10 of our Hawaii trip. And for this trip, I wanted to try out a new camera. And every time I want to try out a new camera, I always try to rent them out for trips because with the trips I get from start to finish of every single day, and I get to see all the ins and outs of how this camera actually fits into my workflow. And it's a lot nicer than just renting it for an afternoon or for a full day because you really only get minimal time with it. So for this trip, I rented the Ricoh GR3X. So there's a handful of different reasons of why I rented the Ricoh GR3X, and it all stemmed from our Italy trip back in October. On this trip, I brought a ton of different cameras. I brought my FX3, I brought a film camera, I think I brought my Super 8, I brought a Handycam, and my Fuji X100V. And it kind of got annoying carrying all these around, and I really didn't want to carry a camera bag around the city, so it pretty much came down to my FX3 or my X100V. The X100V was a great option as a solo carry, but when trying to carry two cameras at once, me being a cinematographer, Photographer, I want to shoot video and I started seeing this trend over time where I wanted to shoot both But it kind of got annoying having both in hand and I still need to make my two-year review of the X100V I absolutely love it But I feel like I'm starting to get into this new kind of season with it where I want a more travel friendly camera to where I can carry something around and still snap daily photos But still carry my FX3 around and not have this bogged down workflow having both on hand and with all this it led me to start researching some some nicer point and shoot digital cameras. The X100V is a great digital kind of rangefinder point and shoot style camera, but it's still kind of large for what it is. And after tons of research, I end up finding the Ricoh GR3 line of cameras. And there's the GR3 and the GR3X, which are the two newest ones. The GR3 has a 28 millimeter full frame equivalent lens and the GR3X has a 40 millimeter full frame equivalent lens. And having these two cameras to choose from made it difficult to pick which camera I wanted to rent for this trip. The 28 millimeter is great for a daily walk around, but you really need to be really close to your subjects. And sometimes shooting wide isn't kind of like my favorite thing to do. But the 40 millimeter is really close to the 35 millimeter on the X100V. 35 is the perfect walk around focal length. So I kind of wish they had a 35 millimeter, but I guess 40 is kind of decent enough. It's definitely split between a 35 and a 50. And sometimes it's a little tight, but oftentimes I end up liking that extra telephoto length. I decided to rent it because it's such a niche little camera where it's a travel daily point and shoot camera that a lot of people use for street photography. But for me, I'm gonna just be using it for daily life and I didn't want to spend a thousand dollars to see if I wanted to actually keep it. So renting it for like 150 bucks for 14 days was a pretty good option. So my first impressions of the Ricoh GR3X, they're pretty good. This camera is extremely small. It's a lot smaller than I was kind of expecting. It's kind of like the size of a credit card, which is pretty insane that all these features and tools are packed into this tiny little body. And even though this camera is really small, it's not that bad to shoot with it. You kind of want to use two hands, but oftentimes just using one hand is really nice and treating it like a point and shoot allows you to only use one hand. And it's nice that the camera comes with a wrist strap because a wrist strap is completely ideal for this setup. I don't think I'd rock the Peak Design strap at all. So far, only having the fixed LCD screen has been all right. I do miss having the flip out screen that I have on my X100V. I shoot a lot at waist and hip level and kind of down low and being able to have the screen that flips out just makes it a lot easier to get the shots that I'm looking for. With this camera I kind of just have to point, aim, and hope that it goes through but it's not that big of a deal. I think having the smaller size is more ideal and a better trade-off than having the flip out screen that could make it a bigger camera. This camera also doesn't have an EVF which is fine because I never really use the EVF on the X100V anyways but there are certain 
times where you're out in a bright and sunny environment that the EVF would be pretty ideal. But for me on this trip, it hasn't been an issue so far. I kind of really miss the aperture ring that I have on the X100V. It's not that big of a deal with this camera because I'm trying to treat it like a daily point and shoot, but aperture rings are just tactile. They're easy to use and I know exactly where my aperture is living at and it's just really fun to use. I prefer it for video shooting as well as for photo shooting. But like I said, it's not that big of a deal so far. I'm not that bummed that it doesn't have one. But overall, I've been really enjoying this 40 millimeter full frame equivalent lens. It fits perfectly kind of within my style. A 35 would be pretty ideal with the setup just because 35 is wide enough so you can get a lot in the scene. And then when you get closer in with your subjects, it's just a nice intimate focal length. I still think 28 would have been way too wide, especially for this trip. So I am pretty glad that I didn't get the GR3. But for this trip, the GR3X has been a great addition and I'm really enjoying that focal length. It sometimes feels a little too tight, but it's not the end of the world because I can step back oftentimes. And lastly, the battery life has been all right. I'm not shooting all day every day like I did in Italy with my X100V, but there are certain times where I get to about half a day where the battery starts to drop pretty quickly. So the battery life I've noticed isn't as good as the X100V. Usually a half day of shooting with the X100, it's like maybe at 75%, but the batteries die very quick and I only brought one battery on this trip, so it's not that big of a deal. It is nice that I can charge it through USB-C, which is insanely clutch because when I get home, back to the condo, I can put on the charger and I'm good for the next day. So I think if I were to buy one, I'd probably own two batteries. I think that'd get me through most of the kind of the shots that I'm looking for. And again, I'm not shooting all day, every day for professional stuff. I'm shooting daily life just as we're kind of cruising around. So I think the battery life could be an issue if you're trying to do a lot more stuff with it, but for travel and vacation and daily life, I think it's all right but I might eat my words by the end of this trip. So yeah, overall, the first impressions are really good. I'm actually enjoying this camera a lot, but it doesn't feel magical and it doesn't really feel like it has this kind of draw to it like my Fuji X100V has. It's an incredible, tiny, small camera, but there's something about the image that I'm noticing so far that feels a little muddy. I'm trying to learn how to expose this thing, giving it a little bit more light on the sensor versus giving it a little bit less. I'm trying to toy around with that and see how this camera likes to be exposed. I've taken some good photos with it so far, but then others I haven't had like any good photos. Whereas when I was in Italy with the X100V, I felt like every photo I took was like a banger. So I'm trying not to get too worried because I know the Fuji a lot more than this camera. So hopefully by the end of this trip, I can have a better grasp on how to expose this camera. I was kind of expecting this camera to blow the Fuji out of the water, but that hasn't been the case so far. Before we get on with the rest of the video, I want to take a moment and talk about today's sponsor, Track Club. Like everything inside of my filmmaking process, I want to work with products and gear that are high quality and are reliable in order to have a smooth workflow. Music has definitely been one of the toughest parts of the filmmaking process for me, and with Track Club, it couldn't be easier. I love Track Club because they have a curated catalog of high quality songs that are absolutely legit. These are the types of songs that you and I would probably listen to while we're driving or hanging out. And finding music on Track Club is extremely easy. You could search by mood, genre, energy, and they feature tons of curated playlist to help you find the vibe that you're looking for. If you're interested in my favorite songs on Track Club, I'll leave a link down in the description below to my own curated playlist. One of the biggest struggles I've had with licensing music for my projects is that these songs just don't have the customization that I need because they often don't fit the vibe and feel that I'm looking for. And because of that, one of my favorite features of Track Club is that you can download stems if they're available. And if you don't know what stems are, they're essentially just the individual layers that make up the entire song. So you could fully customize your music if you download these stems and say if you don't like the drums, take out the drums or if you want to make the vocals a little bit lower, you could do that as well. You essentially get full flexibility and customization over every song to make sure that it molds perfectly to your video piece. So essentially there's no more forcing your video to work with the music. You're allowing the music to complement your visuals perfectly because you have full customization over it. And alongside that, Track Club also offers Mixlab. And Mixlab is essentially the same thing you'd be doing in post, but all in their browser. So you can infinitely customize your music, muting, soloing, adjusting the volume, adjusting the BPM, all inside of their browser. And 
and then once you're done, you could save it and export it and use it for your videos in post. And this just makes it extremely accessible for anyone to get full customization over their music. And Track Club also auto clears your music licensing through track ID. So simply just put your channel ID in there. So for YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, etc. If you put your ID in there, you don't have to worry about manually clearing your music. So this just takes away one more step in the music licensing process and it just makes it so seamless and easy and you just don't have to worry about it at all. Track Club has been a fantastic piece in my filmmaking toolkit and it's been really nice for making YouTube videos. Finding music is so quick and easy. There's really no more digging around through all these bad songs. Everything in their catalog is high quality and it sounds great and it's actually kind of hard to commit to a song just because they all sound so good. So the process with Track Club has been really nice and seamless and I highly encourage you guys to give it a try. Gain a greater level of creative control over your sound, all without leaving your browser. If you're interested in trying out a free month of Track Club, check out the link in the description below. Let's get back to the video. For the majority of the trip, we kind of just hung around, so the camera just was kind of there. But on the activities that we did, the camera never really got in the way. I took it on a Navy SEAL boat, kayak, hiking, trekking down to different beaches. We took it to the beach and I put it in my tote bag and it kind of got all sandy. But the size and weight and profile of this camera really made it easy for me to decide to bring it. I legit brought it everywhere on this trip, even if we're going to get coffee and breakfast in the morning and we're not like going out to go sightseeing or whatever. And because of the form factor, I was able to take so many different types of shots that I probably would have never shot before if I had a larger camera, even like the X100. So let's get into the things that I like about this camera. Of course, the main draw is the form factor. This camera is extremely tiny. I put it in my swim trunks pocket, which it fit perfectly in there. And I primarily carried it in a fanny pack because I wanted to throw my wallet and keys, handy cam, and Ricoh GR3 in there. And having the moment fanny pack across my chest just made everything a lot easier and a little bit more organized. But regardless, I carried it in so many different types of ways throughout this trip. And there was never really a major hiccup with the transportation of the camera. I I also really enjoyed the speed of which the camera turned on and off. It's pretty much instant when you press the power button, which allowed me to take a lot more photos in a last minute fashion than I would before. Because this camera is so small and turns on fast, I could have it in my pocket. And if I see something happening or a cool light, whip it out of my pocket, turn it on, snap, and I'm done. So I think because it fit in my pocket and was small and turns on quick, I kind of wanted to shoot with it more, which is kind of funny. I really enjoyed the highlight metering on this camera and having the little EV thumb lever on the back. Because this camera camera enables you to shoot with one hand. I have my camera basically set up in aperture priority, and then I have the exposure being based off the highlight metering. So if my highlights look too intense, I can press the lever down to bring it down and then vice versa. But I feel like with the highlight metering and the little EV dial, it allowed me to get the exposure exactly what I'm looking for instead of using like a multi or spot kind of photometry, I think that's how you say it. But the highlight metering with a small form factor and that little lever, it's a perfect setup in my opinion. And lastly, I really enjoyed that focal length. By the end of the trip, I completely fell in love with 40 millimeters. I'm really glad it wasn't a 28, 35 or 50. I think a 50 would have been a little bit too tight. 35, I mean, my X100 V is a 35, so I'm pretty used to that, but it's fun to try something different. And I feel like 40 millimeters is a really good balance of allowing you to get really close and intimate and having a little bit more compression to where the background feels a little bit larger in frame, but it's still wide enough to let you get more things in frame. A lot of the times when I'm shooting travel and landscape stuff like this, a 35 or a 28 is just way too large where everything just feels so distant. But I think the 40 really played well in Hawaii because the landscapes are so large and you really want to show the subjects out in these environments. But there's also a handful of things that stuck out that I didn't like about this camera. This camera doesn't have any kind of weather sealing. And for my needs, I don't need, well, I'd like full on waterproof weather sealing. But for me, I just need something that won't let dust, sand, moisture, water, really anything in because I'm taking my cameras out, backpacking, hiking, camping. I bring my cameras everywhere and I don't want to have to worry about anything breaking and having to replace it. So on my Fuji X100V, I can solve this issue with just a filter. But on the Ricoh, there's really no outright fix for it. I've heard that you could put some sort of filter on the front of it, but I don't think it completely makes it weather sealed or weather resistant. So I did notice at some points in the trip where sand would get in because as the camera's turning on and off, it's sucking dirt in and allowing it to get behind kind of like the front part of the lens. It made the little leaf enclosure things on the lens stick quite a bit. So I had to get the rocket blower in there, air it out, and then it worked good as new. But I could see in the long run, this being a very 
big issue. So I could see this camera being perfect for backpacking and hiking specifically, but there's tons of dirt on this trip. Everything is just absolutely filthy by the end of it. So I would be very hesitant to bring this camera long-term on trips like those, even though it would be perfect. So I'm a little bummed about that. I'm hoping that there's a good workaround that I don't know about. So if there is, please leave it down below in the comments. I would greatly appreciate that and that would help me out in my journey. Another issue I had with this camera was the battery life and it wasn't horrible by any means, but it was nothing like the Fuji X100V. And I don't have any scientific testing or actual minutes spent, but to me it just felt like the battery was running out a lot quicker than I'm used to with the X100V. So my first impressions were pretty spot on with this camera, but if I were to buy it, I'd probably only own maybe two to three batteries just to get me through a heavy day of shooting. I don't think you need to carry around that many. I only have have like three batteries from X100V, but I end up only using one. So the battery life wasn't a major issue on the trip. It was just something that I noticed that it was running out pretty quickly. And my last complaint about this camera was the autofocus. And I didn't have that many issues when shooting landscapes. It actually felt pretty spot on. I used the AF center something. There's like some sort of automatic like focusing zone thing. But my issues came when shooting people and portraits. I turned on face and eye detection and priority and autofocus. And a lot of my shots didn't turn out, which was kind of interesting because I'd put my subject exactly where it needs to be. I would snap away and it would miss. So I feel like my Fuji didn't really miss as much, but with this camera, I missed a lot of shots and especially ones I was really looking forward to. So I was pretty bummed about that. I might be doing something wrong or I might've been too close for like the minimum focusing distance, but that was something that I noticed as well on this trip. So all in all, it was a great time with the Ricoh GR3X. I was really glad that I rented it for this trip because I had that feeling that this camera would be perfect for a trip like this. And it was, it was a great daily camera to bring around and it really felt like an extension of myself as I'm traveling around and I'm not like extremely worried about making banger shots. I just want to document daily life, but also have the opportunity to take some really cool shots. And this camera allowed me to do that. And I didn't really miss a lot of the main features that I had in the X100V. This camera does have an internal ND, so I'm able to do the slow shutter stuff that I really enjoy doing. This camera also doesn't have an EVF or a flip out LCD screen, which the EVF I can care less about because I don't really shoot with the EVF anyways on the Fuji because it's not good. The fixed LCD screen kind of made it a little bit trickier for some moments, mostly when I'm shooting from the hip or like trying to be discreet. But those moments are so few and far between to where it wasn't really an issue. But having the fixed LCD screen on the back just made this camera a lot smaller, which personally I would rather have. So I was also really glad that the screen had a luminance adjustment for outdoor setting. So in midday Hawaii sun, I was able to see the screen completely fine. I also didn't miss the aperture ring at all. I thought I would at first, but again, this camera is a point and shoot digital camera. I'm not trying to have all these tactile feelings and dials and buttons and everything. I just want something that simply works, takes great raw photos and gives me the customization that I need to allow me to have a smooth and hassle-free workflow, which the Ricoh Jira 3X was perfect for. So I'm even more confused and it doesn't help that I'm a super indecisive person and I overthink literally everything, but thankfully my wife isn't. So while on this trip, I asked her a bunch of questions about the X100V and the Ricoh GR3 X. She doesn't claim that she's a photographer, even though she has a really good eye. She just doesn't care about gear, specs, any of that. She just cares about if the camera works does the job and is not super expensive. So I asked her a bunch of questions, seeing which one she preferred, if she noticed any major differences, and her answers actually surprised me. So introducing Melissa. Um, I like the size of this one better, and it's a lot lighter than the Fuji, but the Fuji seems a little bit faster if I just want to like pick up the camera and shoot something really quick. This one I feel like almost takes longer to like get and focus and then take the photo. Yeah, the Fuji looks way cooler. <laughs> the colors feel different on this camera. They just seem different, like maybe more dull, but I don't really know. They, they're just different. <laughs> if I had to bring one camera on a trip, it would be hard because this one is nice and light and just easy to carry around, but I would almost say the Fuji because well, it looks cooler and I feel like I like the colors on that one better and it seems faster to shoot with. Yeah, maybe a little. I mean, they both virtually do the same thing. I don't know. They're both good. So there it is. Those are her controversial opinions about these two cameras. And it kind of goes to show that 
we probably are overthinking these things too much and we should just pick something that we like, can afford, and enjoy using. And all these cameras allow you to create amazing photos and if you don't know how to use them, you're not gonna make amazing work. And that's kind of how it was at the start for me when using the Ricoh GR3X. I had a lot of issues with the images up front. And I think as the trip went on, I started making better work. And that kind of makes sense because I was learning the camera more and more. And I was really surprised when she mentioned the Dolor photos of the Ricoh because I saw that. And I was kind of going crazy at first thinking like, oh, maybe I'm just being obsessive and whatever. But if she noticed that too, there might be something there, but I don't know, that might be something we have to dig in deeper over time to see if the sensor actually creates duller images. And of course, in Melissa fashion, she left off with some amazing advice. She said that it doesn't matter comparing between the two because they essentially do the same thing. And I feel like a lot of us gear nerds and camera nerds, we just obsess over comparing which one is the best on paper and in workflow. And of course there's a time and place for that, especially when you're doing things for work. But if you're doing things for fun, like I am with these photography things, it doesn't really matter that much. And it's a very hard place to get to because I love both cameras so much and I really wanna keep the Fuji X100V. But if the Ricoh does the same things for a smaller footprint and cheaper price tag, I might have to go that direction. But myself as a YouTuber, I wanna keep the Fuji because it's fun to talk about and there's a huge community behind it. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any questions about the Ricoh GR3X, the Fuji X100V, or how I edited these photos, please leave them down below in the comments or send me a DM. I'd love to talk to you guys about these cameras. And yeah, overall, this camera was really fun to work with. I highly recommend you guys checking it out because it is a little powerhouse of a camera in a tiny little credit card size body. Thanks again to Track Club for sponsoring this video. All the music you heard in this video was from Track Club. They are incredible. Thank you guys for supporting me in the channel and allowing me to create this video. So that is it. And to end the video, I'm going to give you guys all the photos that I took while we were in Hawaii. Everything was shot in RAW and edited in Lightroom. So yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one. Take it easy. Peace.